Are, are you familiar with the name Sally Jewell? A lot of people around the country probably aren't, but if you live in uh, the Northwest, uh, the name Sally Jewell, probably a lot of you already know who that is. She has the role of interior secretary in the Obama administration. She was giving an interview yesterday about sage grouse. Now, I, I, I saw something about this briefly yesterday. I was looking at some headlines on my, my smartphone uh, while I was in the middle of something else and it wasn't near a computer, and it caught my attention. So when I came into work this morning, I couldn't remember where I had seen it. So I, I put her name into a, a search on the computer and then brought up news over the last 24 hours, and I got a couple of different outlooks on this, and I thought it was worth perhaps sharing with you this morning. First, uh, I'd like to point out that right at the moment, the sage grouse is not is not a protected species. It's not one of those species the federal government is warning uh, is going to go away like the dodo bird. However, although, but, and this is where this story gets interesting. So I went and I, I, I was doing a search on this, and I went and I found a story from as far away as Mississippi in the Sun Herald. That's somewhere in that lovely state down there in the uh, southeastern United States. And uh, the writer is uh, Sean Cockerham, and uh, gives some details on who he happens to be. Uh, and it just, he's, he's essentially, though, using the Associated Press wire copy on this story, but there's a beautiful photograph uh, of two, uh, two sage grouse dancing out somewhere in the, uh, the background here, in the, uh, the outback of perhaps Idaho. But the writer says, Interior Secretary Sally Jewell says she's hopeful that her agency will decide the sage grouse does not warrant listing as an endangered species, a decision with major implications for Idaho and other western states. And it says western governors and other opponents of listing the species are worried about future federal action and anxious for the Fish and Wildlife Service to declare that the birds are not endangered. Jewell's remarks are a, quote, welcome development, unquote, if they indicate the agency is heading away from the sage grouse as endangered, said John Hanian, spokesman for Idaho Governor Butch Otter. Otter said in an email statement that, quote, Idaho does not believe that the greater sage grouse needs federal protections, and we're hopeful that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service reaches that conclusion as well, unquote. Now, there's more to it. I mean, Otter is uh, he's a little suspicious of what's going on with all of this. Let me tell you why. This AP story has admitted something I saw in a larger story on this at a newspaper in Washington called The Hill. Sally Jewell has gone forward and said that if Ted Cruz and his fellow Republicans shut down the government over Planned Parenthood funding, which could happen, and she says, gee, if the government shut down for a couple of weeks, I don't know, that's going to cause some problems, and the federal government may have to step in to protect the sage grouse. I don't see where the two are related, but she seems to feel that a government shutdown would be enough of a crisis where her office would have to come in and Bigfoot places like Idaho. You're up next. You're on the air with Bill Colley at 10 after 9 on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Good morning, Bill. I'm calling from Castleford and wanted to know if I could make a comment about this panelist meeting the Times News is hosting. Can we do that in the next segment? Yes, sir. I, I well, tell you what, it. as long as you're on the line and you made the effort, go ahead. Well, uh, you know, I was really excited about going, but I read in the newspaper that the Pat, the Matt Christensen is going to screen all the questions that come in. I was hoping it would be like an open forum. But to me, this is a playbook right out of Fidel Castro's book on how to hold a public meeting in communist Cuba. It's just crazy. Why not allow anybody to ask any question as long as it's not a personal attack on an individual? And I'll leave you with that. Thank you. And and, and I think because they can screen out questions they don't like. Uh, that's that's the, it, there's a there's a belief somehow among many of the elites, even in places like Twin Falls, you've got people who believe they are. There is a belief among many of these people that their approach is the best approach. And that somehow they're smarter than everybody else out there. And the newspaper folks are the worst. You know, oh, we need to have civil language. No, what they mean is that they and their fellow elites need to control the language in order to control the discussion. And, and that's what the politically correct do. That's what totalitarians do in this situation. I haven't mentioned the date of the meeting. I mean, I'm aware of it. I, I, I can tell you it's sometime next week. 
but I'm not, I've not been giving out details. I had some people who actually said, can you tell us the details? Because we'd like to do a counter demonstration outside. I'll think about that for a couple of days, but I, I don't, I don't think you're going to go to this meeting and you're going to come away. The, the, the feeling is that this will put aside any concerns people have in the Magic Valley about this program. I don't think so. This is only to buttress the argument of the people who are supportive of this refugee resettlement program. That's the entire goal with all of this. They would like to bring people in, sit you down, and then say, well, the debate is finished. We answered some questions. See, that's what they're, what, what they're going to try and do. It's settled now. It's like when they say climate change is settled science. Well, you've got 35,000 scientists out there who say, no, it isn't. Or it's, it's like when they say, well, abortion is a settled issue because of Roe v. Wade. Well, the court that made that decision, even some of the justices later admitted, they didn't have the scientific evidence that we have today to make a, a choice about that. If you want to take that argument, you could say then Dred Scott was settled law. Remember that uh, that particular case? If you have any recollection of your history class, 1857, you had a decision made by the Supreme Court, and it simply uh, it simply it enshrined slavery for a few more years in this country. So these things, when they say they're settled, but this is what they're trying to do. They are trying to bring together a panel. Oh, it's a star-studded panel. We have people here from the State Department who, by the way, profit and make a living off of refugee resettlement. And we have people from the Refugee Resettlement Center who will be there to answer questions, who also profit and make a living off this. And we'll have people there from the College of Southern Idaho to, to speak and address this issue. And, of course, they also profit and make a living off this. Hello? <laughs> Excuse me, but I don't quite understand how we're going to walk away and go, gee, golly, gosh, I never thought about that. And yes, it is a controlled event, probably because the people who are speaking on the panel would refuse to do it otherwise, because they don't want someone putting them on the spot. Doesn't that make sense to you? 914, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, NewsRadio 1310.com. This is an effort, and always has been, to bypass the majority of people who are involved in this, in this magic valley, who will have to live with this decision. It's how government has been operating now for the last several decades. It simply ignores the will of the people. And, you know, we could admit, sometimes there's an old joke, you know, three million Frenchmen can be wrong. And generally, 75 million of them are. However, doesn't mean we're always wrong. And as I mentioned in the last hour, people have legitimate concerns. Most of the people who are out there yammering about what a great idea this is and we have to be compassionate, and they'll make an argument that says, we aren't that kind of people. Who, who are you talking about when you say we? You and the other Cabernet sippers who chomp on a little brie on weekends and pat each other on the back and tell each other how wonderful you are? That doesn't represent the masses. You walk into any local diner and start asking people, polling them what they think about this, I think you're going to get some responses that you're that the left certainly doesn't want to hear. And even some of the folks who claim they're on the right and are doing this because, you know, they are commanded by God to do it. I, I'm trying to find out how they were commanded. I, I just, uh, you know, there is, a, and somebody sent me this last week, and it was from Leviticus, and it mentioned, you know, looking after sojourners in your land. But it meant, it didn't mean people who were coming in and then sitting down and living off of you for for the rest of the, uh, you know, your lives and their lives, and then beyond. What it meant was people passing through. They were going from one place to another, but they had to pass through your lands. Don't rob them. Don't beat them up. Don't kill them. You know, be polite to them and be nice to them, you know, and even, even you know, sit down, maybe have a bite to eat with them as they pass through because they have to get to the other side on business. That's what that means. It doesn't mean that you have to bring them in, give them everything you've got, and be a doormat. 916, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. It's 51. You're up next. You're on the air. Yeah. Um, I used to manage a farm out in Hagerman where we grew watermelon. And we used to bring in refugees to come over and throw the watermelon because it's all got to be handpicked. And it's, it's tough work. And 
You know, I, as the years went by, I started to notice we quit getting refugees that were willing to come throw watermelon because we didn't pay good enough. And we paid pretty good. We'd start them out at 10 bucks an hour and here. Well, what, were, they, were they refugees or migrants that you were employing? <laughs> well, we got them from the CSI Refugee Center, so they were supposedly refugees. Okay. But uh, most of them look like migrants to me. I mean, none of them look starving or anything. So, I, I, I guess you could say that uh, that definition has been blurred for obvious reasons. Yeah, definitely. But it was just amazing to me. I mean, when we first started doing it, the ones that would come were desperate for work. But as the years went on, we couldn't even get them to do anything. <laughs> and they'd rather go do some fun job instead of be grateful that we'd employ them. I thank so. you much for the call. Uh, I, there's only one fun job I know about, and that's mine. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't do it otherwise. I have to tell you, and, and they probably moved up the ladder. I mean, if they, if they were decent people, they probably moved up the ladder and found some other things to do. Of course, if you're getting a free education as well, and we're paying for that, you can be trained to do a lot of other things. Wouldn't it be nice if, if your own children could get that? Well, Bernie Sanders and the president of the United States, and I guess even Hillary Clinton all say that that's going to be possible because uh, they've got a big printing press, so they'll just print more money to pay for it. Yeah, deflate the currency, you know, and, and, and eventually crash the system. It... <laughs> 9.18. Hey, look, I've got more coming up on the program today. I, I just What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you in the next few days when you're going to get an alternative viewpoint on all of this, this, this resettlement issue, because uh, Pastor Sharam Hadian is coming back to the area in just a couple of weeks, and I've got the schedule. I just don't want to announce it yet because by the time he actually gets here in 10 days, it might be forgotten, but I'll pass that along. You're up next, and you're on the air with Bill Colley on Top Story. It's 819. Yeah, for that melon grower, you know, he's having a hard time finding people at $10 an hour to throw melon. That's because our government's paying him 10 50 to do absolutely nothing. I would think that that's a pretty good description. A lot of people can just sit around, and there's a story coming out today. Uh, if we get to it, the Daily Signal has details on it. Thanks for the call. That says uh, the government's going to release its poverty figures today, and it's going to list the number of Americans who are, quote, in poverty, and the number is going to be outrageous. But the writer points out that most of those people have uh, big screen TVs, flat panel TVs, and that they have a, a roof over their heads and that their homes are dry. And uh, he's going to, you know, he's, he's pointing out that what we call poverty in the good old USA just simply isn't what it is in other places, even other developed countries, because this uh, social safety net has become a hammock for a great many people. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Not warming up much today, 51 still.